All right, guys. So uh, everyone can hear me? Yep. All right. OK, so uh, we have uh, Coach Berry from uh, Calgary Dinos, defending champ of the Vanier Cup. So Coach Berry, up to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so you guys, uh, just going to talk a little bit today about defending tight end sets. It seems like these days that uh, teams are looking for different ways to attack us, incorporate some big bodies, some hidden bodies, different things like that. And so, you know, it's a matter of, you know, sort of breaking down how you're going to approach this change to their personnel groupings. And does the personnel groupings tell you a story or does it give away something they're trying to do in their game plan? Or is it something that we have to make a huge part of our game plan? So I'm um, going to go through a few different things and how we've defended, how we identify, um, how we look at different tight end and H-back groupings, and just uh, mix in some film so that you guys got some examples. If people have questions, please shoot them up, because um, if not, I'm probably going to talk a little bit too much here. So um, big thing. All right, just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been the defensive coordinator with the Dinos since 2016. This is my 11th season there. Uh, other roles I've had, I've been the recruiting coordinator, the operations manager, the summer camp coordinator. I coached O-line, I coached D-line, defensive quality control. So I've uh, been there a long time, uh, taking the opportunity to look at the game in a lot of different ways. Uh, now settled into this role, and it's been something that obviously is uh, – been very successful in the last year, so uh, really happy about that. Uh, in the picture here is Coach Wayne Harris, our head coach, holding the trophy with me. And in the orange coat is Marcello Rapini, our DB coach. Uh, these are the two people I work closest with on a daily basis to make our defense work. Wayne was our defensive coordinator prior to me taking over the, thing, the position, and Coach Rapini has been with the Dinos for over 20 years as the defensive backs coach and uh, really helps in terms of uh, – our coverage concepts and how we adjust and those kind of things. So we really work as a collaborative unit many times to make sure that the product we're putting on the field is the best in that sense. Um, so if you look at, you know, why are they using tight ends? I think there's four questions you have to ask yourself when you're looking at this going into a game. Uh, you know, is it a run emphasis thing? Do they have a deep backfield? Are they just a big, powerful group? You know, are they putting 7-0 linemen on the field because they want to just pound the ball at you? Um, you know, is that the emphasis and the, is that what they're looking to do? Because if so, then you've got to build the answers to try and combat that. Uh, is it a pass protection thing? I know some teams we faced in the last couple of years that had really young O-lines shifted to having six O-linemen, seven O-linemen, or an extra O-lineman and an H-back in there so that they could run heavy pass protection sets, which would allow them to get receivers down the field. Or maybe that they, they had three really good receivers and so the best case scenario was to load up on their pass pro and hope that those guys could run routes and get open. So, um, you know, sometimes it's the opposite of what you first think when you see those big bodies come on the field is that they're doing it for protection rather than sort of from a physical attack point of view. Uh, sometimes it's driven by injury. You know, if a team doesn't have a whole lot of receivers left on the <laughs> out there or some of their best alignment are down, again, they may do that. And then obviously in Canada, as we progress deeper into the season, sometimes just inclement weather leads teams towards playing a heavier, sort of uglier version of the game because they want to focus on being conservative and ball controlling. So these are all factors that sort of go into the game planning and why they're using each of um, you know the personnel groups that they decide to do. And then some teams traditionally, it's just a part of their package or that coach, it might be something they believe in. Um, so I think the big question you have to ask yourself first is who are the tight ends? You know, you have to find that personnel. One of the biggest things we do in our organization is obviously identifying the numbers, making that a part of the scouting report, making it a part of your practice where guys have pennies on with those numbers or they have, you know, just a bright orange or a bright yellow penny on at practice so that guys are seeing and identifying that those tight ends or HVACs are in the game. And then from our staffing perspective, we're going to appoint members of the staff whose job it is to spot those guys. So for us, it's always a booth member on defense who has those numbers written down, finds them on special teams, and then sees if they stay on the field for defense, uh, sorry, for their offense against our defense. 
And, uh, you know, but if that's not something you have from a personnel perspective, someone in your group, whether it could be a backup defensive player, you're just giving them two or three numbers to watch. And if those two or three numbers are coming in and out of the game, but I think it's a huge thing to always be aware of what personnel they're entering the huddle with or coming off the sideline with, because that can impact you in a big way. So if you look at this, you know, are they trying to have an extra running back in the game so that they could go two back? Or is it a guy that they put at a tight end spot and then could possibly be a mismatch in coverage against a linebacker? Is it a hidden or extra receiver? You know, is it that guy who, you know, all of a sudden it's their best receiver hiding at tight end and now he's got your Sam or your Will or your free safety on him and that could be a great matchup for their team. Um, you know, probably five, six years ago here in Canada West, Coach Barato with UBC was really good at doing that and hiding Alex Morrison, who's a big human, at tight end, and that would cause some problems for us because he could really stretch the field against some of our defenders. Uh, is it a hybrid guy? You know, is it a guy that maybe is that 220-pound receiver that can still run a nice route but can get in there and stick his nose in and block? Is it the true tight end kid that all of a sudden now, is that a good matchup for a light defensive end or an outside linebacker or a Sam linebacker who might be a smaller guy or is it something that you have to match a big body with and then are they old linemen and then if they're old linemen the dangers that are there is that they're obviously getting a guy whose job is to block so that's a focus but sometimes defenders fall asleep on that kid and you get that guy sneaking out into patterns which causes big problems for you because you know you sleep on him and all of a sudden that guy's wide open in the end zone and you're giving away a free play. So I think it's a huge communication point with your team to for your guys to know and memorize those numbers or if they use a group of guys to recognize those bodies and then to communicate anytime they see some sort of alignment that challenges you. Um, so if we're just going to flip over here to our clips. Um, I just want to take a look at sort of where some teams in the past have hidden or used different personnel groups on us. So this is the our game against McMaster. So here we have a true hybrid player for them. So this guy here, number 30, he lined up in the slot. He lined up at tight end. He lined up in the backfield. But basically, he dictated a lot of what they did in terms of being a submotion, an add-in blocker, a cracker on the edge. And so it was very important for our defense to find him and to track him because we believed – that he would lead to where the play was going. So instead of our normal rules where if guys move across or under formations, we tend to spin our defense. In this case, we, we tracked this guy and so that our defender who was on him would run with him because he tended to lead you to the point of attack. And so like in this example here, he becomes a bomber and he adds in and now all of a sudden we're plus two defenders in the box to play this run right now because he took on our backer, but the guy who tracked him, and now one of our backers is also free. So it just became a thing where knowing what that personnel member is and finding 30 in the game and communicating it allowed us to end up in a better position from a run defense perspective. Okay, if you look at this next game against UBC, they had a number of guys who were tight end personnel or were receivers. So they had 82 and 85, which were this gentleman and this gentleman, and they would sometimes be tight ends, sometimes be receivers. So again, they were more hybrid in the sense of that they were better route runners and athletes than they were blockers. And so you had to be careful because if you lost track of either of these guys, you could end up with a bad matchup, or if the DB thinks that the, the, the linebacker has them, then you create some confusion. And in this case, we got really lucky on this play because this is a case where both DBs move with the motion and forget about the tight end, thinking the linebacker has him. The linebacker has a blitz on this play, and we end up with this guy running clean down the field, and these two doubling the sub-motion, and this guy having to cover it late. Luckily, they hand the ball off on this play because of the pressure our linebacker generates, and we're able to make the run stop but this could be a huge play, and this is something that we really tend to focus on with our guys. So this is poor communication between these three, knowing that he's taking the inside gap on the blitz, and that when they initially aligned, these were the three receivers on this side. And so that's something you have to rep with your guys because 
whether you are going to track or you are going to spin, you have to make sure your guys are tight on that. And so finding that personnel is something that's very, very important because you don't want to end up in a case where they're going to get a clean pass to that guy or it's a huge play against you. Um, next one here, again against the T-Birds. This time they have both guys in the slot, so you have 82 and 85 again, and so it's recognizing what they're attempting to do in this. So for our strong safety and our weak half, and then our, um, in this case, it's a second and long, and so we have 60, we have 60 Bs in the game. Well, the point, or sorry, 70 Bs in the game. The point of this is that these guys can manage this from an edge perspective for us. Because again, we believe these guys are more route runners. And so in this case, when this guy adds into the block, we're able to add an extra rusher as a result of it. And what ends up happening is that this DB ends up getting the sack. So it's just where it comes down to your game plan and identifying how you want to defend these guys. So although these are two H-back type bodies that we've talked about that are in the game, they're guys that we're going to defend on second and long with defensive backs because we know that as you can see, this guy gets beat in pass pro by a DB. Okay, here's an example of where teams are going to hide a true receiver at tight end. So this is number 17 from Sask. He's their fastest player on offense, and they're going to put him at tight end. So we practiced this all week where we knew that we would check into the boundary and we would put our boundary half locked in man and then – our corner would wait on the edge waiting for whatever release came back. So this was a check we built into our system because we knew that this guy was going to try and stretch the field vertically. When they hit him there, their run percentage went way down and it was more likely a play action pass. And so you can see these two guys are communicating here. Free safety's coming across because strong safety's communicating with them as well. They end up moving another receiver into the backfield here. So they have a receiver here and a receiver here now. So they've gone to a, you know, tight end fullback set, but with all skilled players. And so we have, now we have four, you know, three defensive backs locked in on this and the box players are just the ones playing the box. Play action. And because we have our coverage guy in coverage there, you know, we come away with an interception in the red zone and a huge play, but that's due to their communication and identification by that group there. Okay, here's another play against the Huskies. And now you're going to see 59 is a true offensive lineman and number nine is a true tight end. So this is, uh, you know, a big personnel group. This is, you know, an old lineman and a true tight end. So they got big bodies in the game on this and in this case it's a short yardage scenario so it's one where we're going to match that and we're going to go to a 4-4 which re turns into a 6-2 so we're going to put two outside linebackers on the edge 40 linemen and we're going to have two linebackers up top and we're going to be really aggressive and try and shoot gaps on this and if we go to the end zone view on this play you'll see how we're able to allow these front side players to shoot gaps on the edge, leave this guy clean to scrape over the top and really cause some issues for these guys. Because if you can reset and penetrate that line of scrimmage like the front side is here, and then you get a good job by your nose of hooking and holding on to that center, you got a clean scraper here, you got four guys that over penetrated here, and now you have two fill guys who are unblocked. And here's a case where against Alberta, we got the call from the booth that number seven used to be a nose tackle, and now he's playing tight end for them. So we went to a 4-3. So we got three true linebackers in the game, 40 linemen, but he all of a sudden lines up out at receiver. So our Sam linebackers got to expand with him and then be ready to track or to bump it with the other linebackers based on what he's attempting to do. But in this case, it allows our free to push and be the true deep player because he has no coverage responsibility on that guy because he knows he's not looking to push deep. And so in this, you can see they're going to try and bring him as an added blocker and bomber the edge, but because our backer is locked in and knows that that's a blocking player, not a route runner, he's going to shoot it and meet him inside. And so they waste a blocker, or they waste two on him, 
and leaves our Mac clean to eventually fill and make the play there. So again, it's about that identification and finding where these threats are and adjusting accordingly. So here's an example where subs following him in. So is the safety because the second guy's coming. Now all of a sudden we have a defender here and a defender here looking to fill. They end up doubling this, and now these two guys are completely free. Okay, here's another example of Sass with an old lineman and a true tight end in the game. So from a coverage perspective, we got to talk about how are we going to cover this. They go over to where it becomes a quad set. The fourth receiver is the old lineman. So that's our free safeties guy now in this sense because our half is going to push to be the deep player. So now we got to identify we're man here and we're man here. Okay, if these guys release, we got to cover down. But if these guys stay in the block, we got to add in and try and generate some pressure for us. So as you can see, our safety reads what's going on and then adds in late, okay? But he does his job, and then our DB on the backside, this is obviously a plus matchup for us because that guy's not running away from him. And then for the one vertical rope that they run, we end up getting a double team, so we end up in a really good position on this overall. And just by this what looks like free rusher on the outside from our free safety now, this guy's going to get rid of the ball quicker than he wants to, and it ends up where he throws away the football. Okay, final example of identifying personnel. This is one where I talked about where that alignment can be an issue. So they have a true fullback tight end body here. That's a big dude. He's 250 pounds. This is a true alignment in the game. So from our perspective, they have one receiver, two receivers, three, four, five. Okay, and then one of these two linebackers is responsible for the back because we're in cover zero right now. Okay, when this happens, we get confusion. We get a guy running out here with this guy and this guy tracking it. So we get two guys confused about their responsibility. And then all of a sudden, when this guy motions across, our DB chases it and we're left with no one covering the offensive lineman. So as you can see, now we're here, we're here. And instead of having one of our linebackers trade off or this linebacker lock this guy in man, because these two are going, we end up with this guy free releasing up the field. And we end up in an awkward scenario where we lose a rusher because these two are double teaming this guy. And so all of a sudden, you have a picture where you have a completely uncovered player. Lucky for us, this is probably something they'd come back to later in the game, but he's not the primary read, and instead this corner road is. But again, we don't end up generating – we still get a hit on the quarterback, but we don't generate the pressure we want to generate because we're short this rusher, and one of these guys doesn't pick up this. So it's, uh, it's you know – it's one of those things where communication, if it falls apart, it can become very dangerous to you. So although this is not the most beautiful route you'll ever watch run, that's wide ass open and that's something to be a concern. So that's where you gotta have your guys talking and identifying all these different ways that teams can hide and use personnel to cause you issues. Okay, if we go back now to our PowerPoint. Okay. Then we're going to talk about do we match personnel? So, you know, are you going to play the extra lineman? Are you going to play the extra linebacker? Or are you going to play the extra DB? These are conversations you have to have in terms of knowing your own personnel because, you know, are your 12 best players on the field and all of a sudden switching a body or two, does that make you not as strong a football team? Or, you know, is it that if they put 7-0 linemen out there, you know, do you have to put some bigger bodies because your guys can't match up? Or with a tight end, you know, is it someone a linebacker can play? Or have you gotten to a point where your DBs are physical and aggressive enough that they can be the guys who take on those challenges? So that's something very important is to have those conversations and to really know your own personnel as much as theirs. And you want to be true to yourself and you want to, in some ways, test it out. We played, you know, 3-3, three, 3-4, three, 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 we played 4-2, four, 4-3, four, four, four. You know, we put tons of different combinations of bodies on the field trying to stop different things teams have done. But ultimately, you have to find who and what you're comfortable with and what's your best group of players to put on the field and then go back to what their emphasis is and that, you know, is it they're trying to run the ball or they're trying to pass the ball or do it down and distance dictated. And your scouting sheet, also extremely important in all this. So if we take a look at some different uh, 
scenarios involving personnel. Here's one in the first game of the year against Alberta for us. So they come out and they get double tight end personnel. So they put number seven, who's a former D tackle, and number 23, who's a fullback on their team, out there as their double tight ends. Game one of the year, we're not knowing what to expect. We missed this. So we got a 3-3 on the field. And I got six DBs on the field to play a big set. So our guys communicate, talk about a base check, but the error we make is that we don't rotate the strong safety up and the free safety down or rope the strong safety over if we track and leave the free safety high. And so we're short a defender on this side because this guy's at 11 yards and this guy's in the box stacked behind people. So if they're going to run the ball this way, which they attempt to do on this play, then we're outnumbered right now. And so what ends up happening is because we don't attack here, we actually have to get that fill out of our free safety here. And so, you know, that's not a scenario you want. So if we go to the end zone view on this, right now this defender should be here or we should have rotated this way. But we are basically outnumbered over here if they want to get to the edge. And so what happens is we should get a hard inside attack on the tight end here from this player and we should get a hard edge out of the safety. But these two guys are going to be really late. So it puts a lot of pressure on this player here to be the guy who makes the play. And so as you can see, by us being hesitant and then bombering two, for some reason they block double here, and that allows us to scrape clean and make the play. Now our defensive end also does a great job of beating the stretch block and moving laterally along the line of scrimmage to make a play. But because, you know, we're short numbers, basically number eight and number three are of no assistance to us whatsoever unless there was to be a hard cutback scenario. So, you know, this is one where luckily the performance of some other players on the field compensate for the fact that we're outnumbered and we're out leveraged. So this is one where, you know, how the personnel you have on the field can put you in a very, very tough situation. And so that's something you got to be aware of. Okay, here we are against UBC. And what we talked about earlier, these are hybrid players. Well, we're going to leave our DBs on the field. So we're in our 3-3 now. And this is fine because we know if these guys bomber or add in that our linebackers and our defensive backs are physical enough because the greater threat these guys pose is their ability to get down the field. And so this is an example. I'll watch it from the end zone here where you can see 85 and 82 come to the party. And we track that across. And our defensive backs are able to stack up and attack the play. So it's one where, as you can see, 85 is getting pushed back by an outside linebacker, and the other players are getting handled by guys in the secondary. So it's one where knowing your personnel, the advantage is to stay athletic on the field. Okay, here's an example of in our game against Montreal, where they're in a double tight end scenario. They have two big bodies. We missed it from a personnel perspective, so we're in our 3-3 package. And how this hurts us is that these guys are still playing by our single tight end rules, which we'll go over later for this game. But on the back side here, we lose sight of this tight end. Because we haven't moved to a 4-3 formation where there would be an extra D lineman and the linebacker would have some coverage responsibility on the tight end, one of these two DBs has to take that responsibility on that tight end because we're in man coverage right now and instead what we get is this guy pushes vertically both these guys drift and they're able to dump a little pass here for us so it's a matter of because we're not in the right personnel our rules are broken in that they play action fake our linebackers and our front side defenders are reacting like they should but because these two guys are jumping into coverage now this guy is able to leak out and create a play here and so you see where our linebackers trying to retreat in coverage and our corner is extremely late because he made a switch, and now we're trying to rally late to a big person in space. Now, luckily, it doesn't turn into a huge play for us, but it's definitely one that we could have avoided if we had the right personnel on the field. So, you know, that's where, you know, being aware of that or doing a better job communicating, knowing that there's still two receiving threats on that side of the field is extremely important for our guys to do. So as you can see on the next clip here, 
This is a scenario where, again, they come out with double tight end personnel, but this time they've changed it in that this young man is, is one of their receivers hiding at tight end. So they really have a tight end here and a tight end here, and now they have a receiver here, and the rest of these guys are receivers as well. So they sort of reorganized, but it's still double tight end. But it's second and five plus, and we know that this is a high percentage pass team. So when somebody's in the 80% plus in terms of throwing the ball in this second and five plus scenario, then we're going to come out and we're going to leave the DBs on the field because we're more likely to pass defend. And then especially when you see a set like this, you can see all of a sudden now these two and this guy are communicating, making sure that we're aware that there are three true receiving sets threats on this side of the field. And then one of the things we're doing on the front side here is that if we see a scenario where this guy's going to bomber out into the box and we get a lone receiver, we're going to get the strong safety to creep down and become a box player, and it's going to be basically a double team between these two DBs on this guy. Now, when they run crossing routes, then it just drops into a zone. So it's a zone man dictated on if you get vertical threats or not. And then the advantage here is because we're able to put so many players into coverage and they're expecting some kind of man, as you can see, everyone is covered down and our three-man rush is able to generate a sack. So again, knowing down and distance and the combination of personnel, as you can see, 32 here, hiding at tight end is something new from them. And that's something, you know, that we met with our regular personnel because of the down and distance. Now, here's an example of Alberta now, later in the game, going with those two big tight ends. So we're going to come out in a 3-4. So now we have four linebackers on the field and three D linemen. What this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us that the DBs can now communicate. We're one for one here. we got a guy on the tight end. we got a guy on the tight end. We're basically in cover zero, but it's more of a read zone with man under and man over. Okay? And so what the emphasis here is, like I said before, is that that edge player, if the ball is run to the edge, has to be ultra aggressive here so that the second guy who's over the tight end can come and be the fill player right away. You'll see a great example here of where Noah attacks aggressively on the edge and then Lucy is able to come up and be that hard edge player here. Oh, wrong clip, my bad. This is another example of on the short side of how we end up with two players who aren't aggressive enough. This guy doesn't go to set an edge, and then this guy doesn't come to fill, and so you end up with two players in space, and they get stacked, and then he ends up with a poor angle. You can see it better from this. Side. So again, here, once this motion happens, we see the guy talking and tracking. We should be here and here, and there's nobody left in their scheme to block that player. But instead, because both these guys are not aggressive, he's not in his gap, and he's not in his gap, now, all of a sudden, they gain more yards than they should in a scenario where we should have had that for one or two yards. But again, that's recognition and communication. Here's the example of where Noah is aggressive on the inside and Lucy's the fill. So this is a far better example of where we get a guy knowing their gaps and attacking them once they see these personnel groupings. So you can see him come up, dip inside, force the play to bounce, and then the safety, he and the safety make the play on the outside for minimal gain. Okay. Here's an example of where they put the two tight ends to this side, okay? But we had seen that these two big guys had had trouble blocking small people in space. So instead of putting a fourth linebacker in the game because they're in a big set, and bringing or bringing a, a linebacker up here, what we did was we brought defensive backs up, and what we found is that these guys struggled with the speed that the defensive backs brought, and that we could also ha handle man-to-man -man coverage on this receiver. And so this was a game plan thing where all of a sudden you got that wasn't the greatest rush, but these guys tended to struggle with speed on the edge more than space. And so we were able to lock up this coverage so we could have that extra defender in the box. Okay, here's an example down in the goal line where McMaster plays their hybrid player 30 and a true tight end 40. 
at the edges. So they're not putting O-linemen in on the three-yard line. To us, that indicated that they were more likely to pass the ball down here than run because when they ran, this tended to be an extra O-lineman and 40 over here. And that was their tendency. By doing this, what we decided to do was to leave an extra set, of, leave five DBs on the field instead of putting an extra backer here. And that allowed us to be in better coverage where we could send these six and have him spy the running back. And so what it works out for us with is that we get great edge pressure here. And then on the crossing rope, we get a better defender on this, where if that was a linebacker, he might've got run away from, but that's our free safety Lucy, and he's able to break up the ball down here. So that's just a case where knowing their personnel and their tendencies with the personnel, we put better coverage players on the field than run defenders. So again, knowing what teams are trying to do, and when we saw this combo, we weren't going to match this with our heaviest personnel. We were going to leave an extra coverage guy on the field. Okay. Uh, yeah, question? So then the next thing that we're going to look at is how do we attack what they do? You know, are we going to be very basic or safe or check to sort of just a base alignment? Are we going to play a lot of man? Are we going to play a lot of zone? Are we going to pressure when they run the ball because they have certain run tendencies? Or are we going to pressure the pass because we know that they're putting those extra blockers in there to try and throw the ball downfield? So we can look at how we do these various things and how we build them into our game plan. For us, we put a greater reliance on playing man coverage against these sets because I believe we have DBs that can run with guys and I want to commit those defenders to the box. But obviously it's again, knowing your personnel and knowing who you can trust and how you can, uh, how you can maximize that. Um. So here's an example of where Sask put their extra tight end body in the backfield. And so now all of a sudden they're a two back look, but this guy's obviously not a ball carrier. He's never carried the ball on the season for them. And so we had a built-in check where we would switch to a two high look. And what would happen is essentially if he ran sub motion, this guy would cover him. This guy would become a deep pass defender and would get a cover one. Or if this guy ran to an edge and block, this guy would come downhill and be the edge fitter and allow these guys to scrape over the top and fill. And so this was just a check we put in where we saw this personnel and we saw this alignment and we knew that this was a blocker type body and this put us in the best situation to cover it down. And so as you can see, this guy's coming to the edge and our safety's now coming down to match it and to set an additional edge. And then from our perspective, we knew as our linebacker that and our DN that we could come off the backside edge and one could be the ball carrier, one could be the quarterback because this play was going this way. This was their tendency. And so you had a case of where nine had the cue, 91 backdoored and scraped to get the back and you get a great run play. You know, everyone knows where the ball is headed and can be super aggressive on the run play here. So this is something that, you know, we knew from a game plan perspective, and this was a simple check that we put in and practice when we see this kind of personnel and formation. Here it is from the end zone. You'll see 26 talking, aligning, attacking, and flowing to the play. Okay, here's another example against Saskatchewan where we get that same look, and again, we see this time we're in a 4-2, but as we can see, the two safeties have adjusted. They know who the players are. This guy comes to the edge. This is a second running back now, but again, 20 is the Heck Crichton nominee, more likely ball carrier. So we get downhill fill. These guys can all work aggressively to where the ball is at. Okay. Now here's an example of okay. 
Okay, not sure why that clip's in there. That was weird. <laughs> okay, here's an example of against Alberta where we get a double tight end look here. And one of the things that they do out of this is they leave these seven guys in and they run a rollout protection. So what our backers have to make sure they do is that one backer matches the back and one backer loops to get the quarterback. So this is something we practice, and this is an attack rule we put in, that we know if we get double tight end, that they're likely to run rollout pass on this. And so we practice where we penetrate, take the back, loop to the quarterback, and try and generate pressure off it. And so you'll see the example here where, in this case, the tight end blocks him. So this man now has the running back. And now our Mac is free to loop and try and cut off the quarterback. And so you end up getting a late hit here, which Grant became famous for. But it's a good thing that he saw number nine angrily running towards his face on this because he had an open receiver down the field because we are playing man on this. But so practicing that loop technique is very important for us in trying to defeat their slide protection. So that's something that our linebackers work a lot on, and you can see why he automatically shifts and sprints to that and attacks in that way. So that's where we talk about how we can attack and just little things we build into our system to do it. And as you can see, here comes nine, and that obviously changes that guy's throw. Okay, here's an example against UBC where we talked about that 85, 82, 87, the tight ends were, again, staying uh, – were – guys that we're, you know, we're not too worried about from a sort of protection perspective. We're worried about how they get downfield. In this case, when they brought an inline guy here on second and long, they tended to slide the protection. So what we decided to do was take that loop technique we talked about and work it with the DB and bring him to an inside gap because the second DB would protect the outside gap if the receivers work across the formation. And this is one where you can see once they motion, we leave that the two DBs on the back side, and we loop that one DB inside, and it works out into a huge hit for us. And again, you see the loop technique cutting off by the linebacker as well. This time he's far more aggressive. But you can see this is another way to attack loop slide protection is that if you can collapse the front side edge and make them pull up, you can get loop guys that are not going to get picked up because those old linemen are going to turn and pick up their first body. And again, this is an example where this tight end isn't really much of a blocking factor. See it better from this angle. Okay, here's an example of, I'm not sure why I jumped ahead on this clip. This is a 5-2, it's a 3-4 that moved up into a 5-2. And this is one where when they're double tight end sets, when they tried to pull anyone, we found in their balanced double tight end sets, they tried to pull a lot, that if you bring a lot of pressure, it causes major issues with their pullers. And it was one where it caused a lot in the backfield for them. So as you can see from this, if you can create that penetration and they're trying to pull multiple people, it just creates a huge mess on the front side of the play. And again, we went with that loop technique where this backer's penetrating inside and then this backer's outside in case this was some sort of sprint out pass, then we would have that looper built into our system as well. Okay, here's another example of where they went with the stack tight ends on this side, okay? And this is one where we knew their tendency was to run towards this. And so what we did was we brought, again, that looping blitz concept where they're twisting with these guys and it created issues for them on these plays. And so by that guy having to block the little guy out in space, it was able to allow us to set a nice edge because he had to turn, and it meant that this guy couldn't go to the sideline. So because he had to stay inside, now our twisting players are able to overlap and create some problems for him. And that defensive back is actually able to make the play. 
So it was one where we knew this player was not a great blocker in space. So if somebody could move their feet, it would cause major issues for him. So that was one where we would go with a smaller body and attack them in a sense where we knew where they were headed on those plays. Okay, next slide. Now you're going to talk about the single tight end. Is he an inline blocker? Is he that edge guy? Is he a wing? So then he becomes a sub blocker in some cases. Or is he lined up out at receiver and so he becomes a bomber or an add-in guy? Is he a read defend? Is he, you know, is he trying to cause problems for your read defender by releasing? And that guy who's now responsible for the quarterbacks thinking maybe I'm responsible for, you know, that tight end that's releasing? Or is he just a guy who's in there to double team and push the pile? So I think that there's many ways to attack the single tight end and that the single tight end can attack you, but you have to look at how teams are using it and how that can affect what you're up to. In our game against Montreal, we found that when the single tight end was in the game, their tendency was to run to him. So we put in a series of auto blitzes where we would actually blitz two defenders at him and whoever got blocked had a sort of B and E or block state block rule so that he could take him on, and then we knew we wouldn't get beat by some sort of screen or late release by that player. So here's an example of the single inline tight end against UBC, again, leaving defensive backs on the field. But what we knew in this scenario was that, again, these guys were not strong blockers. And so we knew that if we were able to bring pressure against this guy, that it was something that would create issues for us. In this case, it was more about our communication and that because they were motioning, the guy who was up on the line is now moving back and our corner's doing a good job of recognizing there's one receiving threat left here and we have to push all our defenders to the field. So as you can see, we get ourselves realigned, we drop out of this pressure look, and now all of a sudden, you can see we got a very clouded passing picture for them and one two, one, two guys at home for if they tried to run the tight end screen here. So, you know, it was a good job by our corner recognizing this personnel and what they were trying to create an overload on this side and making sure that he bumped the defenders. And as you can see, here he is communicating and pushing them over and recognizing his assignment in all of this. So that's just a case of where when you see those tight ends, you got to be able to readjust your coverage and recognize that it's still a quad set. So whatever our quad set rules are, are something that have to go. So we go from showing a, a high or a six man up pressure, pushing this guy back, rotating this guy over and making this guy our lone defender on this side. So, you know, that's a great job of communication when seeing the single tight end in a passing scenario and these guys working in cooperation to make sure everything we're doing is working out together. Here's an example against Montreal where when they had the single tight end, like we said, their tendency was to run the ball towards this guy. And so our job was to have our outside linebacker and our strong safety blitz inside and outside of him to try and create the hardest run fits possible for them. So as you can see, he's going to work inside or hard off his edge if this guy works down, and then this guy is going to be the next defender there. But the emphasis for us was to create a world where we were closing this gap. So if this guy steps down, he's hard off his ass. As soon as he gets blocked, he's going to spill through and inside the block and force the ball carrier to come outside to Jake here. So as you can see, we get that closed gap. We get that collision. There's no inside run lanes here. So now Jacob has fought free from this. Now our safety's adding in. Heat Mac is able to scrape over the top, and we're able to get enough defenders to the front side where that's a you know, couple-yard gain on first down. Now here's an example of where on this side we should be doing the same thing. There's a single tight end. We should be blitzing here and blitzing here with one of these players running a B&E engagement on him. What we end up having to happen is that we end up with him not being aggressive enough inside and him not coming outside at all. And so it ends up being a play where if they had handed the ball off, this could have been a very big run play for them. Fortunately for us, because we were aggressive and they were passing the ball, it allowed for the defensive line to come after him and get to him. And if 
like I said before, if you're having that discussion of man or zone, you have to have faith in your guys to be able to do both, right? And so, you know, I think the most important thing is, is that if you're going to commit to it and you're going to play a lot of man, you have to have the guys who are able to do that. And so, you know, this was a good case where, although this switch was blown between these two defenders, this guy stayed over the top and the backers were able to actually get underneath to crowd that passing lane, which allowed for the sack to occur. Okay, here's an example of single tight end against Alberta where we get a wing player, so not an inline guy, but a wing. So now we're talking, we're in a 4-3, we have three linebackers. Now this guy has got to be the responsibility as he moves across the formation of the three linebackers. So we're going to bump the responsibility for him so that if he ran out here, he would run with him. If he runs in here, he runs with him. If he runs out here, then this guy's obviously responsible for him in a low scenario. If he were to try and go vertical, then the safety's here to help us. So it's a high-low concept with the two players. What we really focus on here is that if this guy's going to become an added blocker, we got to get in the box and be aggressive on this. So what we're able to do out of this 4-3 is, is we see him come across the formation. We see these guys man up their blocks. Charlie knows that the gap he's trying to work towards is right here. Charlie can now be overly aggressive and shoot this gap because the safety is still tracking this over the top. So if this were some kind of play action, we have that deep protection. But having the high-low concept, Charlie can shoot inside his man and make the fill in the backfield for a loss. So that's just one of those plays where the communication amongst the three backers, See, you see Sabumi here pointing that he's coming across the formation. Charlie realizing that the gap he's trying to run to is opening up here, and we got a really aggressive shoot off that sort of sub-motion defender. So that's a great example of how, you know, that communication amongst your backers and knowing your responsibility now lies in this group of three with this wing player can work to maximize your aggressiveness from your front. So as you see, it opens up here. You can see that's an easy shoot for Charlie. Shoot inside him and make the play. Okay, here's an example from the Montreal game again where we have the single defender tight end here. So we should be bringing pressure off the front side edge with these two players. Okay, we'll watch it from the tight. So again, we should be having these two players come. You'll see Jacob cheating in to try and go. What happens is they're running more of a stretch concept. They bomber this guy to block Jacob. Jacob ends up folded too far inside. And so we get an exchange of responsibility between Jacob and Grant. But because their aggressiveness causes confusion for this player, there's no way to block our safety. And Lucy's able to come up off the edge and make the play for no gain. So although it's not exactly how we drew it up, because you're able to be really aggressive on that front side, it creates problems for this guy who's expecting this guy to be here and he can come down and block him. Or if not, he would come down and block this guy. But because we're now being aggressive, he gets lost in the shuffle here. The gaps are still filled, and now we can clearly come up on the edge. Okay. Here's an example against UBC where they just have a front side tight end. And like we talked about, these guys are of a greater hybrid concern. So we're just going to approach this as he's here to double team. And so all we see here is he's going to lean into this double team. They waste basically three defenders here. The ball can't be run front side. Our backside linebacker who's coming on blitz does an amazing job of getting inside the bomber, and that allows our DB to be an unblocked player on the backside. And so when the ball is decided to be cut back, he can be aggressive at the line of scrimmage. And again, this can be a play for no loss. So. Again, it's looking at how they use their personnel and being really aggressive on those either inline tight ends or bomber edge blockers can really help you set an edge and, you know, create havoc on those inside run plays or those plays that they're trying to work to your edges. Okay. Um, now we'll get on to our last topic and get a couple clips in. Okay, so obviously final one is double tight end. Uh, we started using some terms just to identify double tight ends for us. So heavy was when they would put the tight end and the H to the same side. A skinny look was when a team had double tight ends, true inline tight ends on the line, because you think stretch with that. 
Okay, or you're thinking, um, you know, slide protection. Those tend to be the two biggest things you get out of that. So we call that skinny. And then thick was when they had a true tight on one side and an H on the other. What you tended to get out of this a lot was pullers, was gap scheme type plays. Then obviously with the double tight end, you have to consider that is that slot receiver a bomber or an add-in guy that can cause you some problems? And then finally, how do the double tight ends come into play down by the red zone or at the goal line? So uh, those are a couple things we'll look at here. So here's an example of where we get the heavy look. So we got the two tight ends here, as we talked about before. We walked the DB up on this because we found that these guys struggle with speed. In this case, it works out even better for us because these two guys don't count the DB in their count, and our DB is able to use his speed to scrape free and make the play in the backfield. So again, it's a scenario where using some unconventional personnel or alignments sometimes because they're seeing three linebackers and they're thinking about these guys as the box players. When this guy creeps on up, all of a sudden now, you have a player who poses some issues for them. Now, if they're going to just power double team and run at this guy all day, probably not your best case scenario. But that's one where if he can get outside and set an edge or he can heel line and make a play and you can bring other bodies, then it could be an advantage for you. So that's why you want to look at using the different personnel groupings to your advantages at different times. Now, here's an example of a heavy from Montreal where we get a heavy to the field. So we get tight end, we get H back, and we get a lone receiver out here. A coverage adjustment we made on this, which I talked about a little bit earlier, is that we're going to bring the safety down because he could possibly have to track or spin with this submotion guy, and we're going to dedicate these two players. So this guy's going to become a sort of low trail defender, and this guy's going to become an inside high defender on the single receiver because this is a lot of field for this guy to run routes and cover, whereas over here becomes a little bit more crowded and easier to zone up. So you're going to see the adjustment here where these two guys exchange. He walks up, he walks off. They run slide protection now. Okay, so we're not too worried about, you know, this guy being a pass threat. Okay, we should get some kind of add-in or loop here, but the backers kind of stick to their zone because we talked about that they would be responsible for crossers or back releases in sets like this. And then here, we get this guy to push to be the high defender. The only thing we should be getting here is a little closer trail. Luckily, we do get solid drops out of these three backers because this, could, this rope could be a problem if this guy doesn't trail it as aggressively. But you end up getting where this guy was worried about defending the field with this guy, and now all of a sudden he can rotate back and be a double on this very vertical throw. And then obviously, if you have a guy like Jamin who creates matchup problems up front, Pass rush is something that's just a bonus. Okay, here's an example where we have one tight end, but our second tight end body is here, so we're worried about bomber action. So is he going to come down to the edge and block? Is he going to sub motion across? Okay, so this is one where we talked about our fits with our guys, and we would really look at this as a thick alignment where we have a tight and we have an H because the possibility of those under blocks or those add-in lead blocks are there from this player. So what we do against the thick is we would bring the linebacker up so that we have a big filler right away on the line. The confusion that happens in this play is this is Ross's second play of the game due to an injury, is that we get it where the DB becomes the aggressor and Dean comes up and tries to set the edge. Now, instead of filling inside of Dean and allowing the safety to be the spill player outside, Ross is very unsure, which we'll see from the end zone here much clearer. And we get a play where they actually get some free yards due to the indecisiveness. So because Ross doesn't do the right assignment, Dean stops his feet and doesn't fill tightly here. Now all of a sudden this, there's a lane here and a lane here. Because Ross is worrying about this, when this is his job, Trey should have this covered. Now all of a sudden we get two indecisive players. This guy's able to cut it up and get some yards. The next play we're going to look at, oh, okay, they got a little out of order. Um, well, hopefully I get back to that one in a second. Okay, this is an example of a skinny. So we have a double tight end look. So we're thinking stretch or slide out of this. Okay, so they're going to run stretch out of this play. And as you can see, if you can create some penetration on the stretch, 
Okay, that's a play that you know can be a real issue for them. So when we see skinny, we're to, gonna tend to be aggressive because we're gonna tend to try and create penetration and take away the options where either they're gonna have to string it hard or they're gonna have to cut it back. This back should have strung it hard, but instead he decides to try and cut back on the world and it ends up in a no play play. Okay, here's an example. Sorry, I got them out of order. This is an example of the thick again, where we have the guy down and the H back here, and now you see our alignment occur properly. Ross comes down, so now we have our edge fitter. Now we have our second spun guy high who's going to come over as soon as we see the motion. We have the DV as another fill player, and so you're going to see it from this angle here where it goes much better this time around. So now that we have Ross down, we're going to get our down block. Ross is going to come and collision this play. Now we're going to get a fill inside. Now there is no confusion for the high defender because he sees that there is leverage here, there's leverage here. So he's now an alley player coming downhill to fill this. So we get a great job by Dean collisioning right here. This is what we want to create, legs on legs between the puller and the edge blocker. As soon as we see that, now we're going to come downhill, we're going to fill, and we're going to wrap. Obviously, it would have been nicer if Trey had wrapped up, but that's a great example of how that works. Here's another example of the thick. Now, it should be the opposite where sub is on the line and Ross is back. Like I said, new guy, he was struggling with this mentally a little bit, and this guy just makes some mistakes from time to time. That's just who he is. But the best thing that we see out of that play oh, – okay. Apparently the end zone's not there for that play, so I'll bring this one back. And the great job we see out of this again is that we see our free safety realize that our backer is coming down, there's pullers coming towards us, and our free safety's got to become an aggressive edge player again. And so because our free safety is able to cut this off, now our Sam backer is able to rally with the Mac and make the play. So this is an example where they went away from tendency in the sense of, that they tried to pull two people and get the play wider. And because we screwed up our alignment, we left three guys on the backside doing nothing. But because of the aggression of our free safety, he saves the day on this play. And again, that's big guy trying to make block on little guy in space where it works out for us. Coach, you got a question in the community? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. When you have the linebacker coming the same way, what determines the depth of the Um So it just depends on game plan. In this case, it was because we knew that that, uh, that tight end tended to be, like on that last clip, that tight end tended to be that down block player. And so we wanted that linebacker there to fit whoever the first puller or trapper was right away. And we wanted to create that. Whereas in other cases where we saw in our league where that guy would try and come out and sort of block that player in space, we would put someone off a couple yards or even play that with a defensive back because it was just a matter of either speed and space being the sort of challenge. But if we knew where it was a system where they were bringing that sort of blocker across and trying to trap us or wham us, then we wanted a bigger body there to take that on because we knew it was more likely a guard or another tight end. So. It's just a matter of sort of game plan each time finding where to align the guy and even from their formation or their personnel dictating it as well. So it's not sort of a tried and true rule for us. Worst case scenario, I find that just staying in space challenges someone to make a block more times than not than really getting up in his face. But if you find those scenarios where their scheme or their personnel allow you to get up on the line, then I think that is an advantage you've got to take. Um, sorry, I see we're running close to time here. I'll try and get to the last clip or two. Um, here's another example of just that pressure on the front side. This is one of the single tight end plays. I'm not sure how this ended up way down here. Okay, I think this is one of the last ones against the double tight. And so what we really want to look at here is, again, we get the proper alignment on the thick, but this time – you can see that he manned out on him, so we get it where our D lineman O lays the block and we get the fill from our Mac. So just if the scheme changes up, that's a scenario where having that bigger body on the LOS can create some problems. And as you can see, Ross is able to post this guy and fold back inside to help with the play as well. 
So that's a scenario where possibly having that big body is the right solution in those cases. Uh, okay. So uh, if anybody's got any other questions, uh, please hit me up. Um, tried to share as much as I could there for everyone. Run a little close on time here, so Matt might have to cut me off, but there's my email, there's my phone number, and there's my Instagram. If you want to hit me up on any of those, please do. Always happy to chat football with people. Uh, let's see if we've got another question. Oh, thanks, Coach. Mm -hmm.